Spirit Sessions podcast. I'm your guide, Katie Silcox, bringing you your weekly self-love soundbite. Join us where I'll help you find your true spiritual home, where every single aspect of you is a holy ground. Hi everyone, Katie here. This podcast is intended to inspire you, educate you, and most importantly, support you on your journey towards knowing who you really are, that inner self, that inner teacher. I am not a psychologist or a medical doctor and do not offer professional health or medical advice on this podcast. If you're suffering from any kind of psychological or medical issue, Please do the right thing and seek help from your qualified health professional. Hey everyone, as you will hear, we are doing a podcast today with the unbelievable Mary Thompson. She was one of my very first teachers of Ayurveda and an internationally recognized leader in Ayurveda education. She is a clinical Ayurvedic specialist and Panchakarma specialist who has almost two decades of experience teaching. She's also a founding board member of the California Association of Ayurvedic Medicine. She also is one of our lead core teachers in both level one and level two in Shakti School. And she has been seminal in helping us develop the curriculum for our programs. And not only that, she's just, as you will see, so fun, so real, so funny, so down to earth, and so freaking wise. I hope you enjoy this conversation we had on menopause, aging, and the spirituality of all of it. All right, everybody, here we are, Spirit Sessions podcast. I'm your Ayurveda gal Friday, Katie Silcox here with two-time friend of the pod, Mary Thompson. We are so excited to have you back. Mary, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Happy to be back with the pod. The pod, the pod. So I said this in the first pod and we'll link to it in the show notes if you haven't heard the one we first did with Mary, but this is actually, Mary was one of my first teachers of Ayurveda and kind of like my saving life raft when I was uh, doing Ayurveda college you just had a way of making it so real and so accessible. And yet you are so wise, so brilliant, so, so smart, but also really fun. And I think everyone at Ayurveda school in the Shakti school, you always like get all the rave reviews, Mary. So I'm so excited to have you here talking about some lady business. No, oh, well, thank you. Thank you. That's an awful nice description of me. And yeah. I love lady business. So let's get to it. <laughs> Well, yeah. And it's something definitely, you know, I just turned 44 last week and I think there comes a time in every woman's life where she's like, oh my God, like all these things that my mom and my grandmother and my aunties and and these women in my life kept talking about. And I was sort of like rolling my eyes, like, what do you guys, whatever, that's not going to happen to me. Like the ignorance of Rasa, like the ignorance of youth. (laughs) And then suddenly you kind of hit your forties and, you know, for some women it's before that and some women it's in your fifties, there's this real sense of what's happening on the cellular level around being midlife and having that change, especially for women where you, you know, start to move into perimenopause and menopause. And so I think first things first for anyone out there, just give the Mary description of what what is menopause? Like what's going on when we go through the quote, the change? The change. One thing I love about descriptions of menopause is, well, I just want to back up for just a second. Sure. No, certainly if you came from a lineage where the people, where the, your elders spoke about some of the challenges of the menopause, I think you're actually really lucky. Mm. I grew up where it was, it was a non-topic. And so I was, I was so, I love the word gobsmacked. I was just gobsmacked that I had to experience these things and I wasn't prepared. I think 
hot flashes are looked at as a joke. You know, it's like, oh, he's having a senior moment or my own personal summer or these different, these different things that when you're experiencing it, it's not funny, you know, and it's, we might've been lighthearted about it. And we joke about it before the reality hits and the reality hits. And all of a sudden we're looking in the mirror and we're seeing, you know, changes in our facial structure. We're seeing hair show up where it's not supposed to show up and hair where it's supposed to be disappearing. And we're very frightened, I think, on one part Absolutely. that we're facing this incredible change. And one of the things I love about the definition of menopause it is the natural cessation of ovarian function. It's mm -hmm. a natural shift. Like, could you imagine when you were 12 and your period came on being terrified that this was a sign you were growing older? Mm. You know, I mean, so often we're so excited about it. And it's this big shift that we have when we tell our girlfriends and we're all having this new experience of our body changing. And it's changing in ways that we really want. Because when we're kids, we always want that next birthday. We want to get older. I want to hit 10 because I'll have two digits. I want to hit 13 because I'll be a teenager. And I want to hit 18 because then I can I can vote or I can do things that I couldn't do earlier. And we're always looking forward to getting older until we hit like 21. And that's it. That's our last landmark that we're looking forward to. You know, we could look forward to turning 30, but it's there's no, no prize. No first. one does that. Right. There's no prize. And it's like, and you know, my biggest prize at 65 was I got a Medicare card. You know, <laughs> it's like, a... <laughs> yeah. Well, and it makes me think of too when you're going through menstruation, like, oh, I'm a real woman. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like this, these signs of maturing, and all of a sudden we're hitting one that's a sign of our de escalation, perhaps, that we're no longer maturing, we're aging, mm -hmm. you know. And so I, I really harp on the idea that menopause is a natural cessation of ovarian function, meaning the ovaries no longer respond to the hormones of the pituitary. They're no longer responding to the FSH and LH in order to bring on a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And what's so frightening about that and what makes the changes for women is that every month from your first menstrual cycle to your last one, your body is preparing you to get pregnant. That's the whole purpose of menstruation and the whole purpose of the estrogen and the progesterone mm. is to get you ready for pregnancy. So in order to do that, the ovaries produce the hormone estrogen and the estrogen tells your body to build Datu, right? It tells it, you're going to need more Rasa because in a couple of weeks you could be pregnant. So mm. let's get that Rasa going now. So you'll have extra fluids in your body for this pregnancy. And you know what? You're going to need more blood too, because now you're going to provide blood for yourself and for this fetus. So we're going to ramp up your production of blood. And you know, your muscles need to be toned up because you're going to have to develop new muscles for carrying this fetus and your bones need to be more dense. And so estrogen is telling the body to get ready and it's pumping it up to get you ready for pregnancy. Mm. And then the pregnancy doesn't happen and the body, you know, kind of resets. Okay, fine. We're going to slough off everything. And next month, it happens again. So every month, we've gotten this little boost of estrogen in order to get the dot twos ready for the pregnancy. Mm. And what happens at menopause, we get that the ovaries stop producing the estrogen. So we stop getting that little boost of estrogen to tell the body to make the rasa, make the rakta, make the mamsa, make the asti. And we have to do it ourselves. We have to be eating the right foods and we got to be doing the right exercises and we have to be getting enough rest and we have to be, you know, doing all the things we know to do to regulate the tissues of the body, to build tissue in the body. And we don't get to have the estrogen anymore because the ovaries are done. They, it's kind of like, you know, well, we did our job. Whether you got pregnant or not, we made sure every month that you were ready, you were ready for it, you know? And that's what we're missing. We don't miss the fact that we're not getting a period every month. Exactly. That's a, a relief for so many women. Yeah. But I got to tell you, what's really weird is even 15 years postmenopausal, where I'm at now, I mm -hmm. still check. I still check. You go into the bathroom and you check. And you wow. Say, that's and, amazing. And it's so dumb. You know, you check and then you roll your eyes. Like, what did I think? You know, was something really going to happen? But it's so instinctual Ingrained. as women. Yeah. Women, you know. Yeah. 
I remember hearing from one of my other Ayurveda teachers that, and you know, one of the beautiful things about having a school, Mary, that I've been learning is like, we have all these different, amazing, mostly women, but also a couple guy mm-hmm. teachers. Like everyone has their own way of seeing through the prism of their own experience, Ayurveda, Ayurveda wisdom. And so we have all like a smorgasbord of ideas and the beauty of like, no one's exactly right. Right. Like right. there's just this offering and, and does it resonate and can it be helpful? And one of the things that I was offered was an idea that I think about a lot and I'm not sure if I'm on board with it or not. And so I wanted to kind of get your approach on it. And it was this very sort of strict idea as some of us in the Ayurveda field can become that like any imbalances during quote imbalances during the perimenopause, which is the period where your body begins to cease, you know, having its period and it becomes irregular that any symptomology is not natural. And then, you know, that's a, that's a high bar to set for a lot of women in the modern world under the onslaught of chemicals that all of us live under. And then you have this other idea from women like herbalist Susan Weed, who's like this very sort of provocative, controversial figure, elder figure, who's like, are you kidding me? Like, hot flashes are kundalini awakening. You know, this is you not getting your estrogen and you taught me this, that you've been sort of riding on and leaning into, and now you're actually a queen and you're getting these flashes of heat, but they're in a way like an opportunity for like a karmic burning, if you will. And so I am not symptom free and none of the women that I know are symptom free all their lives. And I'm not just talking about menopause. I'm talking about everything. And so like dance that dance with me of what are the symptoms? Are they natural? Like, should we feel bad about it? And then, you know, maybe we'll get to kind of remedies, although they should just join Shakti school because you do a whole (laughs) join Shakti school. You're the the whole class. Yeah. One thing that I, I always struggle with is the shame around being human, Mm. right? Amen. Because um, last week I I got COVID and Mm. I I was, I was sick and I did something I've only done twice in my entire career, which was call out sick. I would tell my husband, I said, it's been 28 years and I've only called in sick twice, (laughs) but one was for Shakti school. And I almost didn't call because there is so much shame in admitting that we are imperfect. And it's, it's a tough one because there is that arrogance of, oh, well, she's been practicing Ayurveda. She shouldn't get sick. She should have this perfect immune system or whatever. And I say, bah, I say, no, (laughs) that that symptoms, Ayurveda, we can use Ayurveda to manage symptoms and to address symptoms and to bring us back into balance. And I want us to free ourselves from any shame over if I had hot flashes or I had these symptoms that I'm somehow less than someone else who's able to manage it. I remember one time I had an imbalance and I was so grateful that no one could see it, you know, that I had this pain in my body or I had inflammation in my armpit and it's like, nobody could see it. So I could deny that I had any problem. And I just have always thought about that. The arrogance of see me, I'm so perfect. And you're less than perfect because you're not living as cleanly as I am. You're not doing all the things that I do. And I might be just over here in the corner crying because I've got this infection in my armpit, you know? I mean, I think that it's fine that we're derailing and I want to, we'll Mm -hmm. come back to menopausal symptoms, ameliorating them. But Mary, like this is massive because you know this about me. I came to Ayurveda because I had chronic health issues since birth. Mm Mm-hmm. Some of us were not born with the ojas that others, and if you're listening, that means like just the natural vital immunity. And that has been the greatest gift of my life because it led me to Ayurveda and it led me to yoga, which led me to God, you know, Mm -hmm. led me to spirit. And, and I think in Tantra, the cage is also what holds the key. And so by denying these symptoms or, or wanting to like, run away from them. And I struggle with that too, as like the founder of an Ayurveda school, so much self-pressure. I don't really think I get it from the students, but self-pressure perfectionism is such a denial. And then the shadow side of that, maybe you can speak to this, is what one of my teachers calls spiritual materialism. 
and mm. you know, without throwing off on any world, but the yoga and the Ayurveda world are rife with this, where we're doing all these practices to get it, to get the good feeling and to get the bliss. And like, not that there's anything wrong with wanting to feel that, but it's so egoic, right? Yeah. Whereas like Ramana Maharishi was like riddled with disease and like fully connected to the divine, you know? And so mm -hmm. maybe just briefly, what are your thoughts on that realm of navigating like the natural practice of wanting to be healthy with what I know you've seen so much as well, where it's like this obsession with wellness, basically. Yeah. What well, becomes, you know, it's like making money off the wellness field. You know, this idea that if you're not a hundred percent perfectly healthy, then there's somehow you're less than you're doing something wrong. And like you bring up a really good point that there can be congenital problems. There could be exposures you had in utero. There can be exposures you had as a child. Or now. <laughs> um, exposures I have now, right? There's, there's everything. And we're navigating the world as healthfully as we can. And I almost think it's, it gives people that opportunity to come to source, right? To come to center and say, what is it? Why am I doing these things? And what is it that I hope to get out of it? I do a podcast with my brother called Ayur What Now. That's amazing. Thought, yeah, he's not Ayurvedic, but one of the things that he always says is he goes, I want to enjoy my life. You know, it's like, so he'll be often saying things like, so, you know, you have that piece of cake, you do the thing, if, you know, go out and live. It's in his worldview. And he's not an Ayurvedic practitioner in any way, shape or form, but he is, he's the voice of reason, I think that says, you know, we go through everything. I remember one time a student asked me about why are there so many rules in Ayurveda? All these rules I have to follow. I'm supposed to be in bed by 10 and up by six and drink this much water and do all these things. And I, I said, I have to think about that because I didn't have a quick answer. And I came back and I said, you know, really it's your body that has the rules mm. and you have to learn how to read that rule book. Mm, wow. So maybe I've got a body that can tolerate a little bit less sleep and I don't suffer from it, but maybe I have a body that needs that extra sleep. And so I have to really honor it. Wow. Everybody got their own rule book and wow. Ayurveda kind of codifies them, mm. but it still comes at the end of the day. I'm always telling people, listen to your body. Just because I said tomatoes are good for you doesn't mean tomatoes are good for you. You know, wow. it's a that's blowing my mind because you're learning to listen to your rule book. I remember like hearing this phrase in AA, like comparison, like don't compare your inner to someone else's outer. I've been dating someone for five months now, and he is like the six, four Marine who okay. is Ayurveda what? Right. And let me just say, it's like, white flour, right? White sugar, fried donut sandwiches with ice cream and bourbon and beer. And not that he does that all the time. He's really healthy and works out and eats clean usually, but then he'll go on these like complete vacation style food benders. And I'm just like, Mary, if I did that for five mm -hmm. minutes, I would be so sick right. Right. and yet he can get away with it. And it's like, in some ways it can feel unfair. And I think that's very much related to our conversation around women and, and perimenopause and that some women don't even have much symptomology at all. Right. Some women really struggle. And so to just know like, A, it's an individual experience, but B, I think there is a deeper meaning to the struggle and the suffering. Mm -hmm. Right, it is. And it's that coming back to yourself. And loving yourself enough to do the things that help you feel better. You know, coming around to perimenopause, I'll yeah. even tell women, like if they're really suffering with the symptoms they're having, I am not adverse to hormone replacement therapy. Wow. You're putting into place Ayurvedic lifestyle changes, dietary shifts, stress reduction, all the things that you need to have. It's like, it's as if we've been shoved out into the cold without a coat and you're, <laughs> And you're supposed to say, just warm yourself up, you know, as you're shaking and shivering because it's so cold. But I've known people who are, you know, practically suicidal from their symptoms, you oh, know, yeah. that just can't get away from them. Uh, yeah. So on that note, a question we often get, I think everyone listening is familiar with many of the symptoms we've mentioned, hair loss, weight gain, 
lack of digestive fire, obviously hot flashes, vaginal dryness. Mm -hmm. I mean, the list goes on and on skin changes, facial structural changes, everything really under the sun. And one of the things that has been supportive for many women is bioidenticals. You know, you mentioned hormone replacement Mm -hmm. therapy, and we often get the question like, what does Ayurveda say about this? And I just kind of want to front load it by saying, there we go again, dividing the world into Ayurveda and not Ayurveda, right? Right. Like, like is the Vitamix Ayurvedic? Is the, you know, and I'm saying, well, let's think about herbs like Shatavari and and Vitex and Maka and like Vidari Khand and like so many of these herbs were bioidenticals that helped women. So, you know, Ayurveda has- vital hormones. Yeah, they were plant hormones. Right. And so- so Tell me your thoughts on that, because honestly, personally, I'll just say I've been one of those women that struggled at a young age and a very low dose of you can buy at the drugstore, like the sweet, I call it my sweet potato paste, like a little bit of progesterone cream has literally changed my life. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, Yeah. What would be your initial response? So with all things pharmaceutical. I always look to, if it's going to pacify a symptom, that's fine. And then we look at, let's look at what the cause of the symptom is and see if there's some way through our diet and lifestyle, we can address the cause. So we no longer need the pharmaceutical. Right. So if someone comes in to see you and they've got blood pressure off the charts, you're not going to say, you know, I think we're going to manage this with diet and lifestyle and hope you don't have a stroke before we bring your blood pressure down, you know? Right. You're not, you're going to say, go take the blood pressure medication and let's then take the time that we have to address the diet, to address the lifestyle that's creating the problem in the first place. Yeah. And I think that way with the, the hormones as well, it's like, if I'm going to take them and continue all my bad habits, and again, this is a judgment around bad habits, right. but if I'm going to take them and I'm not going to look at my diet and how is that impacting it? I'm not going to look at how much alcohol I drink or if I'm smoking or anything, any other recreational drugs. I'm not going to do any more exercise than I've ever done because, yeah, I don't like exercise. I'm going to continue to sleep the way that I sleep. I'm going to just keep doing my standard American diet, my standard American lifestyle. Then I'm not really going to change anything. And I'm going to be on those hormones because they're pacifying the symptom. And as we know, then under the surface, there are new imbalances that are going to move into place. And so maybe I've done that hormone replacement therapy and down the road in 10 years, I have heart disease, cancer or something. And maybe it was coming anyway, but I've, I've got to pay attention to that. So whenever anybody's on a pharmaceutical that's pacifying a symptom and I'm talking to them, I'm going to see, let's see if we can figure out where this is coming from, what dosha is behind the imbalance and how we can unravel that. It can be super complex. You know, I think like personally, and this is like an ongoing thing I'm working through, you have been the sort of seminal figure of the introduction of a formula I use all the time, Mary, which is Ama Agni Ojas. Like Mm -hmm. for those who don't know, like Ama is toxicity. Agni is your metabolic capacity to digest that toxicity. And that leads to our vital immunity. And I'm like, what's going on with me? I'm like, doing all the right things. Like so many people feel, well, lo and behold, I was living in a house full of black mold. Mm -hmm. Talk about hormone wrecker and AMA, Mm -hmm. right? And so that's been an ongoing thing of learning how to A, move out of that house and blah, blah, blah. It can be so complex in the sense of what is creating the toxicity. And I think so many people are just assuming it's like, oh, it's diet, it's exercise, when really those symptoms can be coming from these hidden sources. And that's where it becomes really challenging. Reminds me of that old scary ghost story about the call is coming from inside the house. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) There's a wonderful term in Ayurveda that I love called upashaya. Mm. Upashaya is when your treatment becomes your diagnostic test. Mm. So You look at, okay, I have this set of symptoms. I'm going to assume this is the dosha that's out of balance. And this is what I need to treat. And these are the herbs I bring in and the diet and the lifestyle. And if your diagnosis is correct, then you should get satisfaction. You should get relief to those symptoms. If, however, you don't get relief to those symptoms, 
I was like this, upashaya. It's oops, um, my diagnosis isn't right. There's something else going on. And so you had to go deeper. The easiest yeah. thing is the eye look at how you're eating, when you're eating, what you're eating, that kind of thing. Yeah. But if that doesn't fix it, then it's like, oh, okay. What about that other pillar, the the sleep? You know, what's happening with my rest and my energy and my my nervous system? That, that wasn't it. Okay. What about my lifestyle? That wasn't it. You know, and then it's I still have the problem. And then you can expand the search. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What have you seen? Like, I mean, again, students, listeners, Mary does a whole three hour class with us in Shakti school. But for those listening now who are saying, okay, I do think that I'm entering, I'm in perimenopause or I'm menopausal. What are kind of the first steps in balancing Mm -hmm. symptoms and what are kind of your top five things you tell women? I mean, it can be six, it can be three. First one that stunned me, I'm still reeling from this, is we talked about how estrogen drives metabolism. It drives the metabolism of the datus of the body, the tissues. Mm -hmm. When you go through menopause, your caloric demand drops by Mm -hmm. 500 calories, meaning you don't metabolize as much because you don't have that estrogen pump forcing you to metabolize. So what does that mean? You can't eat the same thing after menopause. Dang it, Mary. <laughs> it's you so true. It's it. so true. But you figure 500 calories, that's a full quarter of your daily intake, right? That's taking a whole meal and it's thrown out the window. Wow. So a big thing is looking at what are you eating? So it you maximize the amount of food you get for this lower caloric intake. So that means more vegetables, more root vegetables, fewer grains, Ayurveda doesn't vilify any food group. Smaller portions, um, look at high quality proteins. And then, and the hard thing is, is looking at things like alcohol, that's empty calories. You're going to get a lot of caloric input without a lot of spending of it. And sugars, you know, things that are, are sweeteners. And that's, I think, where we look at, oh, why do I have to give up the things I love? You know, and it's like, you're not, you're just cutting back. You know, my brain always goes to the spirit and Mary, it's teaching us though, as women, non-attachment and letting go and preparing actually, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Eventually we're going to have to give up all of the things, you know, in a way naturally it's saying like, Hey, you can't eat as much anymore. Right. And for me, like the shift from crummy chocolate to really high quality chocolate you know, I am satisfied with a tiny piece of high quality chocolate far more than I ever was with a cheap chocolate bar. So it's like looking at those things that you love and thinking, how can I upscale this? How can I bring it up to such a point that it is truly nourishing to my body, you know, and not a mindless, mindless thing. So food becomes a big thing for postmenopausal symptoms, specifically for postmenopausal symptoms of increase in weight. One of the things to think that pooch, the little belly pooch, when your ovaries stop producing estrogen, the fats in your body start producing it. So your body is kind of building a chemical factory in the omentum. (laughs) And it's like by replacing what the estrogen was doing, you won't need it as much. And what that means is you have to become the driver for metabolism. Mm -hmm. And so this means strength training weight training yeah strength training is one of the big things there's some wonderful books like strong women stay young that were done research done on postmenopausal women who just did simple strength training exercises with increasing the weights and things and they increased their bone density which is always a fear for postmenopausal women going into osteoporosis they increased their muscle tone their skin quality improved and their weight balanced you know so it's like huh why? Because you're doing the work of the estrogen. The estrogen's not there telling your body, you need more rasa, you need more rocks, you need more mamsa. You're telling it when you do the exercise. Amazing. Yeah. So stretching, aerobic, and strength training are the three things you want to incorporate regularly, some form of exercise every day. And if you have a yoga practice, you are doing stretching, you're doing strength training, and you're doing aerobic. So you've got, that's kind of the all-in-one package. But if you, if you want to do something different, you want to go dancing, there's your aerobic and it's going to be weight bearing because you'll be on your feet. You want to go swimming that can do some stretching as well as some 
aerobic. And so you can just kind of play with the things you like to do, but you have to move. If you haven't had an active lifestyle before, you kind of need one now because the estrogen's not doing it for you anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that goes along with those things. With the hair, hormones change the quality of the hair. And I remember hearing this on Dr. Oz of all people had said, you know, to tell if you're going menopause, it goes, look at your legs. How often did you need to shave your legs when you were a teenager? And how often do you need to shave your legs now? And it was just like, I kind of did one of those. Oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> it slows down. Yeah, because the estrogen drives that and then we lose the estrogen and there's not really anything driving the production of body hair. Mm -hmm. And we start to thin the hair on top of the head. This is, you're looking more at diet. You're looking more at getting enough vitamin intake, especially B vitamins for the hair. There are certainly Ayurvedic treatments that people can do with amla oil and other oils you can put into the scalp, other herbs you can take that will support hair growth. But it really is a dietary thing because you can't force your body to build hair the way you can make your body build muscle. Mm. You can't, you can't, I can't think really hard that it's going to grow hair. Mary, I'm that. curious, like, I know it changes probably seasonally for you, but what do you like to eat for breakfast? In the summertime, I'm a smoothie girl. They never have ice in them. They never have dairy in them. We've got tons of fruit trees. And so I like fresh fruit in the smoothies and I do organic and vegan protein powder. Yeah. And, um, oh my God. Yeah. By the way, those of you that aren't seeing the video, not that it matters, but Mary, your skin looks like a baby's ass. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, it's ever said that about my skin before. It's yeah. like rosy and like zero wrinkles. I mean, not that it matters, right? We yeah, all have we definitely have like mm -hmm. our radiance and you've always had it, but you have it like every time I see you, it's like more. And I'm I'm glad to hear I want to do a whole podcast on like the taboo and like sort of the wild renegade that I drink Ayurvedic smoothies, but I think they're so good for getting yeah. fruits and vegetables, especially as you said, in the summer with the, I do it the same with like a good protein powder. I usually use like half an avocado and then in the winter, more like, you know, steamed. Oh, in the winter. Yeah. I was, I'm going to switch over to oatmeal. Yeah. It's going to be my thing. I like oatmeal. I like lots of toppings on it. I think. And then in the spring, that's so far off now, I think in the springtime is when I kind of switch to eggs and greens. Oh, cool. You know, I only do that for a couple of months just when I'm working in the springtime because I think the oatmeal gets a little bit heavier. Yeah. So I switch it up, but I'm still in smoothie season and I always, it's again, we feel that shame, right? Yeah, yeah. I like to drink my smoothies. Oh, I, I, I have a whole <laughs> theory of like, I believe that we are in, reincarnated and we've all been all things and we've been yeah. Indians and Chinese and Arabs. We've all been everything, right? And like, yeah. I am certain that our yogic, foremothers and forefathers would have been down with the Vitamix and the, you know, it was just like, <laughs> wow, if the Vitamix showed up in the cave beside the forest, yeah. they were like, cool, you know. Yeah. I've always um, argued with the Vitamix and the Instant Pot, the Crock Pot, and these different it. ways you can cook the fresh food. Yeah. I remember the first time I heard Maya Tawari talk about using a pressure cooker, it was like, oh, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Pressure cooker, for sure. You mm -hmm. changed my life with the whole Ayurveda kitchery where you oh, just- right in all the vegetables and in the thermos and let it kind of cook throughout the day. I think another thing that has been really helpful for me, and I, I'm not perimenopausal yet, but I'm definitely like knocking on that door. And what I've noticed is that doing an Ayurvedic cleanse is so helpful in like removing some of those toxins that are blocking the vitamin and, and mineral pathways and blocking mm -hmm. the, the hormonal pathways so that the estrogen and progesterone like can even reach the receptor sites. And so right. things like as we're coming up in the fall, the best time for that of like just basically eating mung beans and rice and spices and vegetables and like some good fats, like just doing that for three days, five yeah. days is like huge for resetting the system, letting the liver rest and kind of getting back online. And I think so many Americans or people that listen to this podcast and other places, like that's like a completely novel idea, Mary, that you would do any kind of seasonal cleanse, but that yeah. one can help hormone balance, yeah. I think. Definitely. And it's something that you can do. You could do a monthly two or three days a month. You could do weekly one day a week where you do the lighter diet. You can take care and paying attention to that. I can't 
underscore, like for perimenopause and menopause, how important Rasta is, the fluids of the body. And where you mentioned AMA could be in there, toxicity in those, that kind of gums up the system. I'm always a little put off when I hear people say, you know, you don't need to do cleanses because your liver is a cleansing organ, your kidneys are a cleansing organ. As they're sipping their diet soda and eating their hot dog and their processed meat, you know, it's just like, no, what we need to do is to give our system whole food, fresh food, organic food, so that it's already ahead of the game. And then if we choose to take those days where we're going to fast or do something lighter diet and cleanse a little bit, we want to make sure what's getting into the body is all healthy stuff. And the standard American diet really doesn't have all healthy stuff. Correct. I, I often challenge students to go to their the most popular grocery store in their town, not the Whole Foods, not the co-op, not the natural food store, but go to the one that 90% of the people are shopping at and, you know, put on your detective outfit, your hat, your glasses, and just see what people are putting in the cart. Maybe they've got a couple of vegetables in there, but it's a lot of packages. It's a lot of boxes. It's a lot of processed foods, frozen foods. And that's going to be what's moving into, you know, if you are what you eat, that's what they're becoming is this chemical laden thing. And they need cleanses. They need ways, they need time periods where they're feeding the body really clean food so that they're not gumming up the system and uh, making all the pharmaceutical companies rich. <laughs> so, yeah, I was watching, I was seeing a picture of the 1950s beach in the United States. And of course, we don't want to body shame anybody, but Mary, everybody, they had their different dosha or body type, but everyone was quite svelte, you know, yes. and then it cross comparing that with what it looks like now and and just the level of I don't even think it's because people are just gluttonous I think it's like mm -hmm. what you said that packaged chemical based diet it's just so dark that comparison I do think that we are in a time Kali Yuga hardcore where it's like people really do have to work much harder than our ancestors did my grandfather smoked chain smoked and drank whiskey and he looked great you know and, <laughs> and i'm like and ate bacon and eggs you know but he didn't overeat and and the fruits and vegetables mineral content was different and so i think we are living in a time where you do have to really work harder to be healthy right and it's more expensive exactly. you know I'm always advertising for there's a thing you'll find online called the the dirty dozen. And it's a, a card you can carry. It says, you know, with these 10 fruit, 12 fruits and vegetables, you always want to eat them organic. And it's like apples and strawberries and potatoes and things that hold the pesticides. But it's so difficult. You go into a store and it's going to be, I want to get my organic apples. They're going to cost three times the price of my conventional apples. So my organic potatoes are going to be twice the price of my standard potatoes. It is. And so you have to really make those choices. And it's it's not easy. I always say get the highest quality food you can afford. Right. I love um, that. And learn how to cook. <laughs> but so for perimenopausal it's cheap. women. It's yeah. cheap. I mean, we grew up on brown beans and cornbread and, you know, potatoes and like, and that's so cheap, you know, and it's like yeah. so healthy. Mary, like, I guess to close, as you are on the other side of this, what is the spiritual lesson that women, like we framed it and, and we need to help women frame it around symptomology, but what is the spiritual gift that this period can offer, especially once you've gone through it? There's a couple that come to mind. I think one thing we have to realize in olden days, there were kind of three time periods in life for women. There was the maiden, the mother, then the crone. and we're not ready to move into crone. I mean, crone is the wise woman, which is great. But crone, I mean, you say crone and you just picture your grandmother's kind of hunched over and just walking towards the end of life. And one thing I've read, they kind of put something into that space between the mother and the crone is the creatrix, the ability to take control of your life and live out those things. For many women, as they go into menopause, their child rearing days are done. Their kids are grown. And so now they look around, what's my dharma? What am I here to do that I no longer have this burden of trying to make a life and to raise a child? And, you know, what am I going to, what's my mark? What is my project that's going to be out in the world? 
So I think there's an excitement as we go through menopause and as we as we grow up that is what do I want to do? What is, what's my Dharma calling me to do? What, how do I want to leave my mark in the world? And there's a freedom in that being able to see how can I serve in a way that's not deemed appropriate by society? (laughs) You know, there's, what do I do? And that's where we get to open that door and step into our own creativity, whether that is artistic or whether it is occupational, whether it is educational, whether it is dance, you know, whatever the person wants to do. I think there's a freedom in that. Another huge lesson of menopause is self-acceptance and self-love. Mm, major. I mean, your body, we live in a world that really, really uplifts youth. And so you as a woman will garner less attention, less of the male gaze. You will look in the mirror and you'll see now my breasts aren't as perky as they used to be or they're different shapes, or my butt's wider, or, you know, whatever the, whatever your pain point is, you're going to see it. I always grew up looking a lot like my father. And after menopause, I look like my mother. And it was not a look that I wanted. <laughs> That's the title of this podcast now, Mary. <laughs> That's <was> brilliant. <laughs> Yeah. So it was just really interesting to look in the mirror and you do, you're getting older. You, you're awfully kind about my skin, but I of course can see all the changes that have occurred in it. And I see the changes in my hair or uh, somebody brought up a picture from, oh gosh, it was before Keegan was born. So it was like 25 years ago. And I'm looking at this going, I had so much hair, you know, and it was dark and it was, oh my gosh, look at that. That looks really good. <laughs> it was, you know, just there's, those parts we got we have that adoration of ourselves as younger and we want to have like this total love and adoration of ourselves in this moment and that's might be a little bit harder because we, if we've based our love and adoration for self on what we look like that was never a challenge for me i don't want to denigrate myself but i didn't garner a lot of attention when i was younger and so i think i look better now than i ever looked before in my life but what i struggle with is you know kind of loss of mental acuity you know, yeah. can't yeah. find that word I'm trying to think of, just struggling a little bit to put sentences together and not greatly, but my, my value for myself was always in my mind. And then it was like, oh, look at there's shifts that happen here. And so that's another thing I would want to say about, and the third thing would be take care of the nervous system, yeah, you know, so we take care of the physical that. body and taking time for that, whether it's meditation, yoga, nidra, just time and silence, because as women, we're expected to do everything. We can run schools, we can, (laughs) we can write books, we can do all these things. We have all these capabilities. And we reach a point during menopause where we have to honor that, okay, I'm going to prioritize what I've got my energy for. What can I do with it? So it's huge, huge in that spiritual practice of truly accepting the self. Sometimes we we greet people with the namaste, you know, the divine within me honors the divine within you. And then do I really honor the divine within myself? Do I embrace that? Do I take it to lunch? Do I take it to dinner? Do I take it out to play in a way that really honors that I'm a human having this experience or the spirit having this human experience? I think menopause really brings you in touch with, I am getting older. My body isn't the same body as it was 20 years ago. And I want to be okay with that. I want to look every day. It's exciting. You know, the same way as I was a kid getting excited to turn 13. And I was, I was excited to turn 65, but it was a different kind of excitement. Yeah. (laughs) I was thinking, I was telling my partner, how many more summers will we have? And I don't think any 20 year old asks that question. No. No. And, and that there's like a terror. Oh my God, it could be this. Ma- I mean, the truth is none of us know how many we have, but, but in that there's this reverence and appreciation for the rising sun and the setting sun and the moon. How many more full moons will we see and how many more moments? And I think I really resonate with the whole conversation around opening to the beauty of youth fading. You know, I, I come from this long line of like 
Southern Belle beauty queens. And there was such a value placed in my lineage around physical beauty and sexiness and and like being something that men appreciated for that. And man, when that starts to go, there can be this real sense of something inside of you dying. And, and I think it's okay to, for all of us in menopause, we're going to, yours is more like, oh, my acuity and my sharp wit and intellect. And trust me, I resonate with that as well, but we're going to have to kind of mourn, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's the creatrix, but there's within creation, there's always the death and destruction. And it makes me think of Ram Dass, you know, when he had his stroke and like, wow, how that led him into this next stage of his spiritual Mm -hmm. life. And I just pray that I, and we all can have that capacity to let these changes really, for me, what I've been trying to work with Mary is like, and I have been, and it's been amazing. Like I want to offer hope. There is so much luminosity in the dying of that egoic self, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much bliss. There's so much light. And like, that's what makes us actually beautiful. Truly, you know. Because I think so much of it is we're depending upon the outside world to validate us. And we come to that point. There's a lot of women as they go through menopause, they say they become invisible. I have not experienced that. So I don't, (laughs) I don't recognize that. But it's Mary's because still getting seen. <laughs> I still get waited on. People still smile at me. But I think it's for women who had a lot of that external attention, whether it was for their intellect or for their looks or for whatever, because the gaze shifts to the younger generation. Oh, trust me, I'm telling you. I mean, men used to wreck their cars when I would walk down the street. I'm not saying I'm the most beautiful woman, but like I definitely, I didn't know it at the time, but I had pretty power. I call yeah. it. Pretty power. And then Mary, now I'm 44. It's not happening. And so what you find is you are so used to getting it that you're noticing. And this is cool as a meditation. I'm noticing me noticing that they're not noticing and looking. (laughs) And like, luckily I'm, I'm so tantric. I'm just like, it's all God, you know, it's all bringing me back to awareness. But like, I remember a friend being like, one day you'll be invisible. And it was just like, what? And yeah. it is happening. Yeah. See, yeah. I've never dented a car, so I, I can't say anything. <laughs> about that. But um, my, yeah. my cousin was so beautiful. She caused so many wrecks that she <laughs> shaved her head. She was like, I'm just tired of men like looking at me in their car and wrecking. So she shaved her head for a while. And oh, that's wild. she was still beautiful, of course. But yeah. Yeah. And so it's kind of like becoming that beacon of love and adoration for yourself. Yes. You know, look, when you gaze at yourself in the mirror, it's just like saying, yeah, this looks great. I'm going to wear something that I feel really great in. I'm going to do something that I feel really great doing and not worry so much about external judgments, whether they're positive judgments or negative judgments. It's like letting go of that. So there's a huge freedom, I think, in menopause that, that you kind of embrace it. And having that attitude of how many more summers do I have? If you knew that you only had a limited number of summers, what would you do with the rest of this one? You know, I mean, you would so totally invest yourself in enjoying it. And so maybe it's that recommitment to self and to life. And it's a spiritual practice too, just coming home to yourself and honoring all that you are. And there's a freedom in being invisible. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. yeah. Unwanted attention. Exactly. Well, everyone I know is listening, thinking, I want to know all Mary's tips and tricks and secrets. And we're just going to have to say, you can find her. We'll put her website. Mary has been a senior teacher in the Shakti school since its inception. We've loved having you. Mary teaches in our year long course. So you can find more from her there as well. Mary, what wise woman words would you like to leave us with? If anything, you could kind of tattoo on the hearts and minds of the listener, especially in regard to, I think, the most important thread of this conversation, which is like lighting your own lamp. Oh, mm-hmm. What would it be? I have to keep coming around time and again to listen to your body. Mm. 
if you're, you know, if you're doing something and you have that thought, I wonder if this is good for me. It probably isn't. (laughs) Great. That can go for a lot of things, by the way. (laughs) It could. But I think so often we, we read an article and we say, oh, I should do this. And we read somebody else's interpretation. This person had this weight loss tip. And so I'm going to do that one. And you try it and it doesn't work. You're not failing in any way. It's just not the one that that wasn't in your rule book. And so really listen to your body and listen to its own, its own wisdom. And always make those choices that help you to feel better about yourself, better physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually more connected with yourself. Thank you so much, Mary. This has been, as always, just a beautiful heart opening experience. And I appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to be with us on the podcast and yeah, just thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's been wonderful talking to you and I love these kind of conversations. So it was really fun. <laughs> Let's see. It, it challenged my mental acuity. And so I'm, feeling, so I'm feeling good about myself. <laughs> yeah, well, it's still there. I hate to tell you. <laughs> thank you so much, Mary, for joining us today. Thank you. big special thanks to Kevin Carlisle of Goodbye Gemini, who wrote this beautiful podcast music, and to DJ Juan Pablo Jimenez in southern Spain for mixing it and making it magic.